Good evening and welcome new graduate students to the Seton Hall family. We are so happy to have you with us today. My name is Dr. Monica Burnett and I serve as the Vice President for Student Services. In our division, we focus on areas of wellness and support, safety and security, student engagement, academic success, and campus inclusion and community. I'm honored to be your moderator today. Thank you to our panelists who come from all across the university for also being here. Today, we're going to review some key content areas to introduce and welcome you to our community and provide you with tips and resources on how to be a successful graduate student here at Seton Hall. So first, we're going to begin with some introductions. Panelists, I'll call on each of you to please introduce yourself and your department's role in supporting graduate student success. Um, let's start in the POVOS office with Chris Cuccia. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Chris Cuccia. I'm the Associate Provost for Academic and Graduate Affairs. Uh, I've been with Seton Hall University now for about eight years, um, and presently I'm overseeing three different offices, the Office of Graduate Affairs, as well as the Office of Institutional Research and the Office of International Programs. Um, graduate Affairs in particular plays a critical role for our graduate students in supporting the onboarding of graduate students throughout the admissions process with applications, um, document processing, and so forth. Um, so again, I do want to welcome everyone here this evening. As Dr. Burnett had mentioned, we're certainly very excited that you're with us uh, and appreciate you being here at Seton Hall. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, we'll move to Brooke Duffy in the library. Hi everyone, my name is Brooke Duffy and I am the coordinator of instruction librarian and um, I'm going to be talking to you in a few moments about all that the library has to offer. Thanks Brooke. Next let's go to Paul Fisher in the, the teaching and learning center. Good evening everyone. Welcome to Seton Hall. My name is Paul Fisher. I am the associate chief information officer at the university and the director of our teaching learning and technology center. It's our role to help our faculty integrate technology into the curriculum and to help students use technology to reach their academic goals. So uh, we'll be talking to you a little bit about the resources available to you and uh, hopefully we get to work with you in the future. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Next, we'll move to the Career Center with Justin Kraft. Good evening. Uh, Thank you. Uh, welcome to everybody. My name is Justin Kras. I'm the Associate Director with the Career Center. I've been here about seven and a half years and the Career Center works to support graduate students with kind of outlining uh, the steps to achieve their professional goals during their time on campus, jobs, internships, etc. and developing the tools to help them have a strong foundation and achieve those goals while here and post-graduation. Thanks Justin. Next we'll move to student engagement with Winston Roberts. Good evening. My name is Winston Roberts. Uh, welcome to Seton Hall University. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Services. I've been at Seton Hall University for 14 years. Uh, student engagement is your opportunity to connect and integrate into campus through our co-curricular activity. The Office of Student Engagement is our home to Student Activities Board, which is responsible for much of our signature events, such as Blue Day, Weeks of Welcome, even Christmas at the Hall. Fresh uh, Fraternity and Sorority Life, or our FSL office, Student Government Association, student clubs and organizations, as well as our Graduate Student Association. I look forward to meeting you all. Thanks, Winston. Now let's move to financial aid with Gary Thomas. Good evening um, and welcome once again to Seton Hall University. Um, my name is Gary Thomas. I'm the Associate Director in the Financial Aid Office. Uh, I've been with the financial aid office here at the university for 22 years. I was 22 years last week. Um, and really what our office is doing is, is trying to match students uh, with financial aid opportunities, um, whether they're student loans, scholarships, um, graduate assistantships, um, anything to make a, a Seton Hall education more affordable. Uh, and we'll, we'll be going over some, some finer details in just a few moments. Thanks so much, Gary. And last but not least, our university bursar, Kathy Winterfield. Hi, welcome everybody this evening. Uh, I look forward to talking to you a little bit later. We're responsible for your uh, tuition billing and issuing any overages, refunds 
that you need for living expenses while you're in your graduate program. Uh, my staff is well versed in all of this, and most of them have either been with the university over 20 years or have been students themselves. So we're well versed in helping you and welcome and talk to you in a little bit. Thanks so much, everybody. So as you can see, um, we have uh, a breadth of knowledge through and across our university to help answer any questions that you may have regarding the graduate student experience. Um, so over the, the last couple of weeks, we've been gathering some questions um, from our graduate students. So here are some frequently asked questions that, that we have, and we'll have some of our panelists respond as well. If you do have a question that you would like to ask, please go ahead and um, put that in the Q&A chat box, and I will be sure to get to that too. So let's start first with academics. Um, overall, graduate students are really excited to begin their academic journey at Seton Hall. So the first question goes to Chris Cuccia. Can you please provide a brief overview of academic graduate services and where should graduate students go if they have questions about their academic program or advising? Thanks, Monica. And yes, um, academic support services for graduate students are certainly very, very critical and, and an important component of our graduate programs. Um, I'm proud to say that our faculty um, the administrators within our colleges and schools, and certainly those offices that are represented this evening, um, all go above and beyond, I think, to serve our students in the best and most comprehensive manner possible. Um, a lot of the most critical central services available to graduate students are represented on this panel. I mean, as you heard, university libraries, financial aid, student services, and so forth um, are all here, which is great. Um, among the most critical academic services, if you will, that are available to graduate students would come in the form of faculty advisement. Um, the faculty is in itself an essential resource for graduate students. Um, for those of you who are attending that who are pursuing a second graduate degree with us, you know that the dynamic between student and faculty member uh, tends to be vastly different at the graduate level. Um, I can say from my own experiences that those differences were reflected in both the nature of engagement with the faculty as well as the level of discourse within the courses themselves. Um, your faculty will serve in a number of roles during your time at Seton Hall, those being mentor, um, advisor, teacher, potentially even research partner. Um, and you'll likely be assigned a faculty advisor prior to your first class with us. It's important that you connect and engage with those advisors as early and as often as possible because they are in so many ways a lifeline. Um, the faculty will assist with everything from course selection, exploration of career opportunities, oftentimes in collaboration with career services and others on campus, um, dissertation and thesis support, um, as well as recommendations for future programs or professional pursuits. Um, worth noting is that delivery of academic support services varies very much from college to college and even from department to department within a specific college. Um, that's why I always recommend to new graduate students that they remain in close contact with their academic department who will be able to direct them to the appropriate resources internally. Um, in terms of additional support services that are certainly more academic in nature, um, I would want to briefly make reference to critical services such as the Academic Resource Center, uh, the Writing Center, and University Libraries. You'll hear more about those services in the minutes that follow from the subject matter experts themselves. Um, suffice it to say, the Academic Resource Center can assist graduate students with critical components of graduate life, such as you know, time management and work-life balance and even test-taking strategies. Um, effective writing skills and the ability to convey ideas and research and writing certainly are essential for any graduate student. Um, and so in that regard, the Writing Center provides both synchronous and asynchronous tutor, tutoring writing services that are critical. Um, and in terms of university libraries, they of course offer subject librarians and research support among other services that can be extraordinarily beneficial to graduate students, as well as access to scholar study rooms um, that can serve as a really quiet refuge for doing some additional work and catching up on assignments. Uh, and finally, I would say a resource to graduate students that I would encourage everyone to familiarize themselves with is the graduate catalog. Um, which contains a wealth of information that's both common to all graduate programs and even some that is unique by program. 
uh, the 2022-2023 academic year catalog will be out very shortly and can be accessed via the university's website, which is shu.edu. Thanks, awesome. Monica. Thanks, Chris. Um, we just got a chat that came in or a question that came in through the chat. Um, how many credits do you need to take per semester to have a graduate assistantship? And how many credits do you need to take to be a full time student? So I think Eric can jump in as well, but in terms of being a full time student, that would be nine credits at the graduate level. Um, generally, we look at four and a half technically is comprising half time study with us, though it's rare that someone would be in four and a half credits. Usually it equates to six, but um, full time study would be nine credits, and that's generally the requirement, I believe, for most of our assistantships as well. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Um, so Chris touched upon this a little bit in terms of academic support, um, but many of our graduate students ask about specific academic support from the library. So we're going to move to Brooke Duffy for the next question. So how can the library best support students um, that they may choose to learn remotely? Um, and what will library access look like for our graduate students? Hi everyone, uh, thank you for this question and I'm really excited to talk to you about what the library has to offer and to show you exactly how we can support you both in person and remotely and how you can get the most out of our resources. Um, so I'd love to just show you my slides if that's possible at this time. And um, yeah, so graduate services at Seton Hall Libraries. Um, so the thing I would I'd like to just point out to everyone first and foremost is that we are here to support you as people. So um, one of you know we certainly have um, databases and other resources that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, but the library is uh, comprised of subject librarians and other library workers who our entire purpose for being here at the university is to help you find information and to help you navigate that. And I know when I was a graduate student, I really appreciated having the support from my campus librarians. And so we're really looking forward to passing that along to you as well. So I'm going to be talking about um, a couple of libraries. I'm going to be talking about the main Walsh Library campus. And I'm also going to be talking about the IHS library campus. So um, we can go to the next uh, couple slides here. Skip too long. And there we go. All right, so um, the Walsh Library is the, the main campus library located at the South Orange uh, campus. And uh, also for those of you who will be accessing our resources mostly remotely, the library website, which is library.shu.edu, is also um, a library space in a sense because that is where um, our online resources can be accessed from. So the library website has a, a ton of information and uh, helpful services. Right on the main web page, you can check every day to see what our daily hours are. And in the, the fall and spring semesters, most days were open until midnight. And uh, so, you know, hopefully you, you won't be there too, too late most days, but um, if you need it, we're, we're open. And um, we also have on the library website almost 600 databases. And each one of those databases contains uh, thousands of articles. So. That's what I mean when I say we're here to help you navigate that because there is a wealth of information that you have access to as a Seton Hall graduate student. In addition to that, we have your traditional print books that you can browse on the third and fourth floors of the library and millions of ebooks. So again, if you're a remote student or mo mostly accessing our resources remotely, um, you can get everything you need and more um, just from accessing it through the library website. Uh, another uh, tool that we have that is really uh, helpful and I think special is that we have research guides that we've created for every single graduate program 
And these are composed of the, um, the most important databases for your subject, in addition to other services that may come in handy. Another really special offering we have is individual research or citation appointments. And these can happen uh, however you, you prefer. They can either happen in the library in person or we can meet here through Microsoft Teams so that you can be wherever you need to be. We've done them for uh, graduate students on their lunch breaks, uh, after work. So, you know, wherever you can squeeze in a research appointment, um, you can get in touch with us. And additionally, there's a couple special services we have that a lot of our grad students make use of, which are our research data services. And this is a team in the library devoted to data management and data visualization. Um, we do workshops and also appointments for data services. And we also have a team devoted to dissertation and thesis support. You can go to the next slide now. All right, so um, just reiterating here, you can um, make a, a research appointment in person or on Teams. Other ways to get in touch with us, there is a live chat that is on the library homepage. So when you go to the website, you'll look in the bottom right hand corner and look for a yellow chat icon. So when we are um, when the desk is staffed, which is uh, generally speaking 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. most days, you can just type in a question and a librarian is on the other end and can answer your question. You can also reach us via our email and this email goes to all the subject librarians. So um, we get you a really prompt response and make sure that um, whoever is best qualified to answer your question is going to get that answer for you. And again, you can access um, these databases and research guides anytime, anywhere. Okay, we can go to the next slide now. Okay, um, so in terms of on-campus resources, we have um, lots of quiet study areas the third and fourth floors are for quiet study you'll notice when you walk in on the second floor that it's oftentimes bustling and a little bit noisy but that's because a lot of students like to come and grab a coffee and meet there so we encourage you to do that as well but rest assured there's the quiet space you crave to get your work done um, including uh, the silent study room which is um, located near our, our front desk um, we also have a couple of new spaces to support uh, your needs. We have a prayer room, so if you um, find yourself needing a, a quiet space to, to pray in the middle of the day, you can go to our front desk and ask for the key. We also have a fantastic wellness room created by our counseling and psychological services. And I checked it out recently myself and I wanted to stay there all day. It was so calming. Um, and we also have a lactation room in case you are a, a nursing parent. Uh, other wonderful features, we have a, a special collections, archives, and gallery on the first floor, and these are uh, available to you to, to make use of. You can book appointments and come uh, use these resources in your research, and they're phenomenal uh, 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 faculty and staff down there as well to help you out. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention how you can get your, your caffeine infusion while you are working. The Dunkin' Donuts is actually within the library, which is very convenient. Um, and it's also located right next to our 24-7 study space. And this is a space that is only for those affiliated with Seton Hall, but you can swipe in with your ID card any time of day to find a quiet and secure space uh, to study. Go to the next slide now. So the other library I wanted to mention is the IHS library, which is at the Nutley campus. Go to the next slide. Okay, so the, the Nutley campus, um, their, uh, their website is the same as ours, except there's um, a slash IHS at the end. Um, this library is actually open 24 hours, so it can be used any time of day, but the library staff are there from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. 
Uh, they have 400 health and medical nursing databases for you to use and thousands of ebooks. And in addition to um, the graduate research guides that the Walsh Library provides, the IHS Library creates these um, research toolkits which are dedicated to a wide variety of um, medical knowledge and tools. And uh, they also have a fantastic study room uh, service, which you can actually book online your space in advance. Um, really nice study rooms and uh, computers, Wi-Fi, and staff to help you out. Go to the next. OK, so the Nutley campus, um, their librarians uh, can answer questions via email, but they um, primarily operate through uh, research consultations because of the nature of the work they're helping you with. Um, consultations are recommended unless you have a quick question. Um, but again, their databases and toolkits can be offered um, online, uh, accessed anytime, wherever you are, just logging in with your pirate ID. Next slide. All right, so the bottom line here is that we are here to support you. And again, um, there are, you know, we're made up of uh, a wonderful team of librarians that um, have a wide variety of expertise. So I'm going to talk to you just quickly about how you can connect with your subject librarian. Um, so again, remember, no matter what your program is, we have a librarian de dedicated to that area of study. I'll mention that mine um, are English, women and gender studies, history, and I support a couple other areas on a need uh, as needed basis. Um, so if you're not sure how to get in touch with your subject librarian, we recommend you just send a quick email to uh, ask at shu.libanswers.com and say that you're a new graduate student and you wanna connect with your subject librarian. And we would be happy to meet with you or talk with you virtually, however works best for you. And uh, lastly, I will just do a plug for our um, Seton Hall Instagram, uh, uh, Seton Hall Libraries, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook accounts, because um, these are great resources for keeping up with the workshops that we offer, new resources that we get at the libraries. And um, I also have to say that the archives and gallery do a phenomenal job of featuring some of the treasures in our collections. Okay, next slide. All right, thank you so much for your time. And please just um, get in touch with any questions that you may have either throughout the rest of the program tonight or afterwards. Thanks again. Thanks, Brooke. So another question came in uh, regarding academic support and technology support available. So the next question is for Paul Fisher. Um, can you please explain the various technology classroom support available for graduate students? And we had just another question come in in the chat regarding. Um, hold on one second, I'm sorry. Um, how do graduate students uh, get access to their laptops? Thanks, Monica. Mike, if we can go to the first slide, that'd be great. So um, thank you everybody for making time tonight. I wanted to uh, go through some of the resources that we have available at, at Seton Hall. Um, if you haven't already accessed any, any technology at Seton Hall, I sort of want to um, describe what we call pirate net and that is really not one thing at, at Seton Hall University. It's really the suite of tools and technologies that we make available um, to all students, faculty, and employees at the university. And that's really your portal or your gateway into all IT services at, at the university. Um, <clears throat> it's where you can access your email. Um, of course, you can add email to your personal devices like your laptop or, or phones or tablets or things like that. But um, this is the place on the web that you would centrally get to all of your resources at the university, be it uh, Microsoft Office or uh, any other particular software package that we might be using in support of, of graduate students. Registering for classes are going to be here um, and, um, and doing any of the typical business that you, that you have with the university. So next slide. Um, 
I want to really talk about online learning platforms. So my understanding is many of the people on this call may be in a fully online uh, graduate program. So uh, the technology is really your lifeline back to the university and, and your professors. And we offer a few different technologies that the, the faculty uh, can deploy at the university. We've learned a lot through uh, our, our COVID days and uh, pivoting to remote learning. So our faculty have become quite experts. Um, I, I think one of the positive things that uh, that have resulted out of this is that we have all realized that while you may be in an online course, both asynchronous and synchronous learning uh, can support our students all, all at the same time. So we have four different tools at the university that, that faculty members use in different ways. Um, if you uh, really want to understand what your professor is using at a given time, more than likely, uh, they, they will let you know what the requirements are for for participating in in the activities that are required for the class. Um, so Microsoft Teams is the same sort of technology that we're, we're using today. Um, it allows us to really provide for a 100 percent synchronous but remote uh, online learning experience, just like we're, we're doing today. Little bit different. This is sort of one way communication. A few of us to many of you. Um, typically, Microsoft Teams works just like uh, Zoom. Many people are familiar with Zoom, but you can have the um, the back and forth conversation in real time with your peers and, and with your faculty member. Blackboard is our learning management system. Again, it's accessed through PirateNet um, and it uh, really is the home base for all of your classes. Uh, almost 100% of our faculty utilize Blackboard sort of as the foundation for a course. So that's where they put things like their syllabus. Um, they'll put things like course policies, assignments. Many of them use it for the grade book. Uh, we automatically populate courses with some of the library resources that Brooke just took you through so that it's easily accessible from within your course if you need to get there. Um, so Blackboard is an important, uh, an important tool for you to go and check out. You will only see the courses that you're registered for. So we, we try not to, um, we, we try to make it very seamless for you to get to where you, where you need to go. Blackboard Collaborate is an add-on to Blackboard that does, sort of does the same thing as Teams does, uh, and there's reasons that faculty use that versus versus Teams, but it is, is an option to get there. And again, your professor will let you know which technology they, they are using. Echo 360 is really a lecture capture piece of software, so a lot of our faculty are, are using um, Echo 360 to deliver their lectures outside of class time. So if you're in a graduate program, be it a traditional graduate program or 100% online program, uh, one of the things that we've learned over the 20 years of being in online education is that our time together is very short. And we want to try to use that time together with our students in a much more valuable way rather than just delivering a lecture over PowerPoint slides like I'm doing right now. Um, but instead, from, from a course perspective, you know, getting you to sort of consume the material uh, on your own time and utilizing your time with your professor um, in a, in, for deep conversation, conversation with your peers, you know, thing, things like that. And Echo 360 allows a faculty member to record the appropriate material that they might be typically giving a lecture about. And and you can read that at lunch at work or, you know, listen to it on your commute in, into work or into campus or, or something like that. Just giving um, giving him or her uh, more time to dive deeper into content rather than just talking at you. Uh, so next slide, Mike. Um, online exam sof software has become very important. It was hugely important during our, our pivot to remote learning for, for COVID, um, but ultimately it serves two other purposes. Um, Honor Lock is, is the, the uh, tool of choice. Um, it's very easy to use. It allows us to ensure the academic integrity of online and remote exams um, by requiring things like identification and um, scanning rooms and, and things like that. Um, but again, to, to feed on what I just said, it allows a faculty member to deploy an exam that is maybe a half an hour to an hour long and not take up that valuable class time but allow you to have that class to take that exam um, in the comfort of your own home in a space where you know maybe there's a little less anxiety we we did we do have spaces on campus for people to take remote tests at if there isn't that place at home um, that that is comfortable for you um, but again it does two things it allows it, it gives the faculty member more breathing room to dive into content 
um, rather than to proctor an exam either in person or or remotely and take up that hour of a class session. Um, and it also ensures the academic integrity of, of the course, which benefits us all um, as you gain a credential and, and go either out into or back to the workforce. Um, next slide, Mike. So everybody gets access to Microsoft Office if you don't already have it um, either at, at home or at work. Um, you have access to all of the uh, suite through PirateNet on the web, um, but you are also allowed, Mike, maybe click it one more time. I don't see the bullets yet, I just built the slide. Um, so with the Office uh, suite comes uh, your, your Seton Hall email address, which is your first name dot last name at student.chu.edu. If, if you have a common last name, um, you may have a number thrown in there um, after it just to differentiate you from the people who came before. Um, so you get email, you get one terabyte of storage, and my colleagues at the library and data services will tell you that it's really very important to use OneDrive or something like it. Many, many people come uh, to the university with Dropbox or Google Drive, and they use that for their personal documents or their documents at work, um, so they're more comfortable with it. And OneDrive works the same way. That's the university supported technology. Uh, and what it allows you to do is not worry about where your data or your papers are or, or, or any of your multimedia that you might be creating or using in the, in the course of your academic work. It's always in the cloud. It's always accessible from anywhere in the world, and it doesn't matter what happens to that device. So I would encourage everyone to store uh, all of your really important stuff, even if it's not that important, in, in OneDrive. Um, I already talked about web versions. You're also allowed to download uh, the Microsoft Office suite on up to five computers um, and uh, and and use it wherever you are. So if you find yourself at grandma's and and you need you need full fledged word because you you have to edit a paper that a faculty member gave you feedback on, you can in install that um, on on up to five computers and use it as your um, use it to your whatever you need to complete at that particular time. We talked about Teams a little bit. Teams is a little bit more than just um, a video conferencing like we're using it today. Uh, every course on the campus gets a Blackboard course shell and a team site. Um, so the faculty, faculty across the curriculum um, many times use that as sort of the casual engagement between students in a class or use it to advise students and, and ask questions without um, having to be real time, right? So sending a chat message to either another student in your class or your faculty member um, just allows people to respond at, at their convenience and and uh, gives you sort of that digital record. So lots of lots of professors use um, use this as a discussion board uh, through throughout the course. And you know if if you weren't if you were at work or or working on a, another um, project and weren't paying attention all the communication is there for you to 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 sort of look at as you um, as your time makes available for you. So um, it really it teams gives access um, to your peers and and your faculty in, in a much in a much easier way. Next slide. So lots of training opportunities. Uh, we, we have all of this software and we have a plethora of other software. We have access to SPSS for statistics and uh, Stata for uh, which is another statistics package. But lots of people say, well, I, but I don't know how to use this stuff. Um, and, and between the Teaching Learning Technology Center and, and the University Library offerings, um, there's always someone around that will help you to understand how to use the technology we've deployed and that the faculty members using in their classrooms. So uh, I'm sure this is on another slide, but technology.chu.edu is, um, is uh, the technology website at the university, and that should always be your starting point for trying to figure something out. What's available to me or how do I do something? Um, the search on that page searches our knowledge base. Uh, there's a live chat if, if, you need, if you need help, and then, um, and then lots of lots of other resources in particular on the university calendar and, and this can be accessed from anywhere on the web uh, anywhere on our website um, you'll see different training opportunities that that we offer whether it's you know how to use excel or or how to create a survey for your research um, with with qualtrics next slide LinkedIn Learning is another great resource that we've that we've uh, we've made available to uh, the entire student body over the last couple of years. Um, everybody knows what LinkedIn is, uh, but LinkedIn Learning um, not only uh, links your professional profile to uh, the university, but it also opens 
um, a myriad of of different training opportunities that you can consume on demand. So if you're in, in the accounting MA program and you need to understand how to use Excel to balance a spreadsheet, but nobody's around, it's two o'clock in the morning, that's when you just put the kids to bed and now you have the time to do it. I can guarantee you there is a module on LinkedIn Learning that's just a few minutes long that will uh, give you the pointers that that you need um, that you need in, in order to complete your assignment. So please take an opportunity um, to, to go through that. Uh, as you go through modules, you get little badges. And again, it's linked back to your profile. So as you build your professional portfolio, people can see that you've gone through these modules and you're proficient in, in certain tools um, as, as you go through um, as you go through your career at the university. So, um, you know, shoe.edu slash LinkedIn is a good way to get started. Most people just search the university's website for what they're looking for. So that'll, that'll work too. Next slide. Uh, we are soon, uh, we have just been named and soon to be rolling out our Adobe Creative Cloud Suite. Uh, the university has been named an Adobe Creative Campus, it's first, first university in New Jersey. Um, and, and really what the partnership allows us to do is at a very discounted, uh, cost and with lots of resources coming uh, to the university from Adobe in general. It allows us to make the uh, the the really Cadillac tools in producing videos and photographs and print pieces uh, available to the entire community. Um, so when you are uh, writing your dissertation um, and you need really cool graphics and charts to to uh, to illustrate some of your data, uh, we have some of the uh, we have the best multimedia tools available to to the community uh, starting this semester. So we just announced it. We're in the process of figuring out how to how we roll it out. Um, it'll be an opt in program, so you'll have to fill out a form and then we'll respond with uh, with some steps on how you get access to it. So we're very excited about this. We already have um, probably about a dozen programs across the university figuring out how they're going to incorporate these tools um in into their into their curriculum so uh, more more to come on this um and uh, uh again we're, we're very excited to offer this to our students next slide two-factor authentication you've probably been through this piece already if you needed to uh if you needed to sign in for tonight's webinar um uh, du duo two-factor obviously protects us from um, hackers that might steal our passwords uh, I, uh, all of the password information and, and two-factor authentication is on our website. I won't delve on this too much because, again, I'm pretty sure you had to sign in in order in order to get into um, into the webinar tonight. So you've already used this. Congratulations. Next slide. I'll make a note to delete that slide next time. Um, so technology support, right? Uh, it, lots of support. We're here 24/7. Um, we have options uh, from the technology website to chat. Um, the service desk is uh, www.shu.edu slash service desk. By service desk, it's a, it's a technology service desk. So any questions, um, there's a knowledge base there. There are services that you can click on and actually consume. Uh, one of those services will soon be, hey, I want the Adobe Creative Cloud. So you'll click on it, you'll, fill, you'll sign in. So we already know who you are. You'll fill that out and then it, it gets sent to the appropriate party. Um, if you're having a problem, this is the place that you want to go. Um, I would um, encourage everyone to follow our social media um, because that will give you uh, early alerts to any issues that we might have that we might be having. So Friday we're upgrading some some Wi-Fi technology on campus um, that'll get tweeted out. Uh, we'll post it on the sign in page and it, it's just a good way for you to stay abreast of you know what's happening on the campus if i need if i'm going to go to campus and i need to do some research but the the network is down well it's a good place to check um to check that first before you get here although that never happens anymore um so service desk at shoot.edu is your friend that should be your first contact if you if you have a question or you need um, a resource, service desk at shoe.edu. You don't have to stay on hold. We do have a phone number, 973-275-2222, um, but nobody likes to make phone calls anymore. Um, so between email and chat, those are really the two main uh, ways that the community um, uh, asks questions and gets resources from IT these days. If you happen to be a law student, uh, or a student at the law school, even in the MSJ, either in the MSJ program or as a law student, um, we separate that a little bit and the email address is law help desk at shoe.edu shoe and the, the phone numbers on the screen as well. 
So I think that is my last slide and um, I'll address any questions that we might have that uh, that might have come through the chat when when Monica tells me I'm supposed to. So thank you again for taking the time. Uh, welcome to Seton Hall. Uh, we don't know uh, if something's broken, so please don't don't uh, hesitate in letting us know that you're having a problem. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we did have a couple of questions regarding laptops. Um, can graduate students use their own laptops or do they have to or can they use um, Seton Hall laptops? So our graduate programs don't don't um, receive laptops from the university, only our undergraduate programs do. Uh, but you have full access to the university network. Um, when you get here, you'll you'll sign on to a Wi-Fi that says SHU, uh, SHU campus or just campus, sorry, campus. You use your PirateNet credentials to sign into everything here at, at Seton Hall University. So same username and same password that will that will get you the access that that you need. And again, you can install um, uh, Microsoft Office on up to five computers, so you can do that on your laptop and most of the other software like the stats program and stuff like that. When you request it, we'll give you the instructions on where to download it from. Great, thanks Paul. Um, so now we're going to move into financial support. Some of our graduate students are concerned about financial aid options. So the next question goes to Gary Thomas. What is the typical financial aid experience or process for graduate students and what are the requirements to receive financial aid? All right, thanks for the questions, Monica. Um, so what we're going to do here is just go through some slides that have some basic financial aid information, um, you know, from filling out an application to getting a refund, you know, once loans have been applied to your account, um, sort of the, the A to Z. And if you're at any point, you know, if you're at step Y um, or L, uh, hopefully uh, you'll find this information useful. Uh, and we can advance to the next slide. Uh, so the main financial aid application that we suggest students fill out uh, is the FAFSA. It's the free application for federal student aid uh, is available through the link um, here on the on the presentation. Um, right now we're in the 22-23 school year. Uh, the FAFSA is year specific. So if you're if you've not yet completed the FAFSA for the 22-23 school year, um, you can still access that application through the FAFSA site. Um, the application for next year for the 23-24 school year uh, would be available October 1. Um, so it kind of as you're getting into the the you know the flow of the fall semester, um, which is 22, 23, that that application for 23, 24 would be available, uh, and you can go ahead and complete that application for the second year of your program. Um, we won't process eight awards for you know 23, 24 until next June, um, but if you get the application in um, submitted, you don't need to worry about it um, as you're kind of going through the rest of your academic year. Uh, the Seton Hall School Code uh, is 002632. Um, even if you're at our Nutley campus, uh, which would be our nursing programs um, or our School of Health and Medical Sciences, um, you are considered Seton Hall students. Um, so if you're filling out the FAFSA, uh, you would want to make sure that you are entering that school code uh, as 002632 um, so that our office can receive that information uh, and process your aid award accordingly. Go to the next slide. Um, so by filling out the FAFSA, basically what you're applying for uh, are federal student loans. Uh, these loans are federally guaranteed, uh, which means that approval for the loan is not based on a credit check. Uh, it's not based on income. Um, certain, there are certain minimum requirements they have to satisfy. Uh, enrolled in an eligible program um, on at least a half-time basis. Um, you have to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident uh, and not currently in default on a previous student loan. Um, and you shouldn't have any issues taking out federal loans for your program at the university. Uh, I know it was mentioned earlier. Um, Full-time status for a graduate student is, is nine credits. Um, so to satisfy the half-time requirement, um, you have to be taking at least five credits per semester. Um, if we don't offer half credit, so it kind of 4.5 rounds up to five uh, to satisfy that, that half-time requirement. The federal loan um, is $20,500 per academic year, uh, which for most students will break down as $10,250 for fall and another $10,250 for the spring semester. Uh, loans for graduate students are unsubsidized. Uh, this means that interest would accrue on the loan from the time that the funds are dispersed to your account at the university. Uh, so if you have a $10,250 loan for the fall, uh, we might get that disbursement on September 15th. Uh, interest will begin accruing on that portion of the loan um, as of September 15th. And if we get the spring disbursement of another $10,250 on February 1st, 
you know, for the for the second semester, interest would begin accruing on that portion of a loan uh, as of February 1st. Um, the interest rate for this year's loans is fixed at 6.54%. Um, the, the interest is both fixed and variable. Uh, it is fixed per year. So any loan that you're taking um, for the 22-23 academic year uh, will always be fixed at 6.54%. Um, loans they take out in future academic years uh, would be fixed at whatever the rate is um, for those future years. Uh, there is a loan origination fee of 1.057% uh, that gets deducted from the from the loan prior to the funds being uh, applied to your account at the university. Uh, this is not money that that Seton Hall is receiving. Uh, it's deducted by by the federal government uh, before the funds come to your account. Um, and I make mention of this just because you know if if you are looking for a loan disbursement of 10,250. Uh, it will be 10,250 less that 1% fee. Uh, so it's something in the range of $10,142 uh, would get dispersed. So, so if you're you know, looking at the, the loan amount listed on your bill, um, it is different or, or a little bit less than, than the amount that, that was accepted. Um, that fee is, is where, where that difference is coming from. Um, halftime requirement is, is a requirement to, re halftime enrollment is a requirement to receive a loan. Uh, it is also the trigger for repaying loans. Um, so once you graduate or otherwise drop below half-time enrollment status, um, that is when your loans would go into a, a repayment um, status. Um, and the way that the loans will work is you will fill out the FAFSA. Uh, we will offer you the maximum loan possible, uh, which again for most students would be that $20,500 per academic year. Uh, the next step of the process is for you to log into your Seton Hall PirateNet account uh, and accept the award uh, for the amount that you want to accept. And we can go on to the next slide. Um, so I know Paul mentioned it a little bit a few minutes ago. Uh, PirateNet is, is is a lot of things. Um, and the the main area that you know we deal with in the financial aid office um, is sort of all within that profile and finances tab. Um, you're you're going to view uh, your billing statement there. You're going to access your financial aid awards there. If there's any financial aid requirements, um, all that information would be in the profile and finances tab. Um, this set of instructions it doesn't really change year to year. So right now we're in the 22-23 school year. Um, you're just logging in, um, you know, pulling up the award information. There's a drop down menu to select the aid year um, for the next year for 23-24. You'd follow the same instructions. I'm just selecting the, the different aid year uh, when prompted uh, within within the um, portal. The the process of accepting or declining your awards uh, is all done right in in PirateNet. Um, we've offered you a loan of twenty thousand five hundred dollars. Um, you are not obligated to borrow twenty thousand five hundred dollars. Um, there's an area in PirateNet where you can reduce the loan to any amount that you that you actually want to borrow. Um, so if you only need 8,000, 10,000, 15,000, uh, that's the amount that you want to borrow. Um, just enter that amount in PirateNet, click accept the award, uh, and it will be reduced to that amount. Uh, if you don't want the loan at all, just go in and click decline, uh, and that award uh, would come off of your account. Um, one of the limitations of PirateNet is that once you take action with your, with your student loan there, um, you can't undo it or change it there. So if you were to log in today and decline your student loan, um, because you don't think you need it and then you know October rolls around or, or November rolls around you say you know what I do need that loan um, you can't reinstate it in PirateNet uh, but a simple email to, to my office um, and we can reinstate it uh, on our side um, the reverse of that is also true if you were to accept the loan award today and then next week you realize you know what hey I have a scholarship or I'm, get, I'm getting a graduate assistantship um, and you don't need or, or want the loan um, you can no longer decline it in PirateNet but again, a simple email to our office uh, and we could, we could adjust that for you on our side. You go, go to the next slide. Um, so you, you've completed the FAFSA, you've accepted your loan award for the amount that you want to accept. Uh, there's still a few other um, loan requirements that need to be completed uh, before the funds can actually be dispersed to your account at the university. Um, studentaid.gov is, is the federal direct loan website uh, linked here in the presentation. Uh, is where you will go to complete the master promissory note uh, and the direct loan entrance counseling. Uh, the promissory note is what it sounds like. It's a note that you're signing, acknowledging that you're taking out a student loan uh, and that you promise to pay it back when the time is appropriate. Um, you'll enter two references. You'll sign it using your FSA ID, uh, which is the same ID that you use to sign your FAFSA. 
uh, and it's done. It'll take you three minutes to do it. Uh, the direct loan entrance counseling is a bit more involved. Uh, it's basically going over your rights and responsibilities as a borrower of federal loans. Um, so there's a section on budgeting. There's a section on repayment options. There's a section on interest rates. Um, so it's a lot of information. Um, it's not difficult to go through it, but it will take you 15 or 20 minutes to make it through. Uh, the good news is that once you do the entrance counseling and the promissory note, um, you don't need to do them again for the duration of your time at the university. They will carry over from year to year. Uh, so those are sort of the, the requirements that, that you are able to satisfy. Uh, the final uh, requirement that we've listed here is verification of attendance. Um, this is actually a process that your faculty members um, need, need to take some action to, to satisfy. Um, before aid can be dispersed to your account, uh, we have to verify that you are attending class, um, which is just something that, that faculty are aware of. Um, e emails go out to faculty on, on, how to, on how to submit that process. Um, so as students, really the only thing that, that you need to do or, or that you can do to satisfy that attendance requirement uh, is go to class. Um, you know, and then your professors will, will take care of it from there. And we can go on to the next slide. So that federal loan uh, is twenty thousand five hundred dollars. That is that is the maximum loan amount available from that loan program. Uh, depending on the cost of your program, uh, it may or may not be sufficient to fully cover all of your charges. Uh, if you do need additional loans, uh, additional funding options to cover um, you know, any other tuition and fees. Um, or things like off-campus housing or on-campus housing. Uh, there's a couple of loan options here. Uh, the Graduate Plus loan uh, is another federal loan, uh, but it's not a guaranteed loan. If, if you're interested in the Graduate Plus loan, you would actually have to submit an application. Uh, there is a, a credit check involved, uh, and the approval um, would be based on that, on that credit check. And we also have some loan information listed online at that elmselect.com. Uh, this is sort of private lending institutions uh, that we vetted, that we've identified as being legitimate loan companies, uh, legitimate loan products, um, and we just house the information on that Elm Select site. Um, as a financial aid officer or, or really anybody at the university, we can't say use this loan, don't use that one. Um, so what we do is, is collect all that information uh, and put it on that Elm Select site uh, for students to review, um, to take a look, see what's there. You, you can compare one loan with another. Um, to, to make a choice as to which type of loan uh, you do wish to use. Um, any loan funds or, or any aid at all uh, that is applied to your account uh, that is more than you owe to the university for tuition and fees uh, would come back to you in the form of a refund check. Um, the bursar's office, Kathy will, will I'm sure mention uh, kind of the process of, of refunds in a bit, um, just in terms of timeline, um, the way that loans work, you know, and I just mentioned a moment ago, we, we do have to wait for the semester to begin uh, and for faculty to record or verify that you've attended class. Um, so aid disbursements tend to be, you know, the, the second week of the semester um, with refunds going out shortly thereafter. Um, I'd like to make mention of it because there are students who are taking out loans. Um, you know, they've moved to South Orange or they, they've moved to Nutley from Michigan uh, and, you, you know, they may not be working. They're looking to cover the rent expenses uh, with these student loans. Uh, just in terms of a timeline, again, it is probably mid to late September uh, for the fall and early February uh, in terms of refunds for the spring semester. Let me go, go to the next slide. Um, kind of going back to, to Paul mentioned earlier, um, Seton Hall email is one of the, the elements of PirateNet. Um, every Seton Hall student does get a Seton Hall email account. Um, and we realize that you have you know, your undergraduate email, you ha might have a work email, you have your Gmail account, uh, and you don't really need or want this other Seton Hall um, email account, um, but you're gonna get it anyway. Um, we do ask, and this is especially important in my office, uh, if you're not using that Seton Hall email as your primary email account, um, please be checking it for messages from the university um, that are vital to your continued enrollment at the university. Um, if there's something missing from your loan application or if you didn't do the master promissory note, um, all that information is being sent to you um, at your Seton Hall email. And if you're not checking it um, periodically or, or, or even regularly, uh, you could be missing information, um, you know, not only for financial aid, it could affect registration and billing. Um, so again, just, just be aware that you do have a Seton Hall email account uh, and that information 
vital to your enrollment at the university is, is going to be going there. Uh, so we do that ask that you are are checking in for information. And then here's the information. Here's some contact information for the financial aid office. Um, we have a financial aid at, at shoe.edu email account. We have an 800 number. Uh, if you're on campus, um, we are in Bailey Hall on the main level. Um, you know, we we have Teams appointments. Um, so if you if you aren't on campus and have more you know an involved question that maybe you don't want to send over email, uh, if you go to the to the main financial aid office webpage, um, there's a there's a calendar to set up a, a meeting invite. Um, and I will I will kind of put that um, information in the in the Q and A here. Um, I will also post some information on graduate assistantships uh, and some other scholarships um, that that we do offer for graduate students. The the main um, content of the of this presentation has ended up being student loans um, for for many reasons. The, the 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 biggest one being that for most students, student loans tend to be the the primary source of funding for graduate students. Uh, we do offer some scholarships. Um, many of the scholarships that we do offer um, get awarded through the admissions process, right? So, it, so it's the graduate admissions folks in each of the colleges at the university um, have some some uh, process or determination of, of who's eligible for those scholarships. Uh, but I will post some information on other scholarships, um, other endowed scholarships at the university uh, that graduate students can apply for. Um, graduate assistantships are, are another great way um, to help defray some of your uh, tuition expenses, uh, a typical graduate assistantship on campus uh, would have a student working 20 hours per week uh, in exchange for 24 credits of, of a tuition waiver per academic year. Um, and that is sort of broken down as, as the um, hiring department sees fit. Uh, so a typical award might be split nine credits for the fall, nine credits for the spring, six credits for summer uh, for a total of 24 credits. Um, but you know, I happen to be the person in, in the office who posts those awards. Um, and as I get those approvals from, from the departments and from the provost office, um, I do get them posted pretty quickly. Um, so if you are a GA, um, you should already see the, the and, and have been hired and the paperwork has been submitted, uh, you should already see that that award on your financial aid award on in PirateNet. Um, if you've been hired as a GA and that information is not yet in PirateNet, um, it basically just means that we haven't received the, the, the paperwork yet. Um, you know, so if you, if you are concerned about your GA not showing up, um, just contact your your hiring department. Um, you know, to check on the status of, of any paperwork re related to the GA award. Uh, so that's the the end of the the presentation that I have. I, I'm not sure if there was some questions that may have come in to the chat. Yes. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Um, about um, additional options uh, for deferment. So if there if there was a process for defer, deferment of current loans while in the program, um, I think you covered that in terms of the um, the process, uh, the website that you showed earlier. Is that right? Yeah, so so the the enrollment requirement to defer um, existing student loans is half time, um, mm -hmm. which for, for graduate students would be five credits. So, so long as you are enrolled for five credits per semester, you are eligible uh, to defer payments on existing student loans. Um, there's two ways to do that. Uh, the registration office will automatically send out enrollment information um, to a, a, a loan clearinghouse, um, and then individual um, lenders will use that information to update their records uh, for student enrollment. Um, that is the easiest option for students. They don't really need to do anything. Um, the information is automatically sent out on their behalf. Um, the downside of that option is that the information isn't always timely, right? If you have if you have a loan payment due in September um, and the registration office is going to send that information out October one, doesn't really help you for that for that September payment. Um, what you can do is if, if you want to ask your lender for an in school deferment, um, you could send it to the registration office. You could send it to the financial aid office. Um, we could fill out the, those forms uh, and get the, the deferment process going a little bit faster um, than the automated process of, of that information going out to the clearinghouse. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Um, so in the same way, graduate students are asking about some of the payment services available. So um, the next question is for Kathy. Uh, what are some services the Bursar office provides and how can graduate students access their payment portal? How do payment plans work for graduate students? Hi, thank you, Monica. 
I'm uh, Kathy Winterfield, the University Bursar, and I'll talk to you about just a few highlights on your student account. As Paul Fisher had said about the PirateNet, it's very important that you become familiar with your PirateNet student portal because that's where all of our information is online. Uh, my office is responsible for making sure that your tuition bill is accurate and it's on time, and we're responsible for processing a refund to you when you have excess aid from a loan and you may need that um, urgently for living expenses. I know as a graduate student, sometimes it, it's imperative you're not able to work while you're in school, but you still have um, family obligations, financial obligations to meet. So if we just start with the next slide. This is where you access your student portal through PirateNet. And what I wanna really point out because there's so many times people get to this and they say it doesn't work. If you look in the bottom left hand corner, it says continue. You have to click that continue button to access all this wealth of information. So I just wanted to point that out to you. If you come to the screen, you say, oh my God, how do I look at my bill? You have to go down and click continue in the bottom left hand corner. Next slide. This is what you'll see after you say view and pay my bill, continue. And what I wanted to really just um, spend just a few minutes on rather than how to look at your bill. I'm sure by now you've registered and you've looked at your tuition bill. This is where you want to look for your um, your refunds. Many, uh, like I said, graduate students, you are borrowing excess money for, for books, for laptops, for rent, for food. This is where you can sign up for an e-refund. I highly suggest that you sign up for an e-refund. When the financial aid office posts your aid, we have and are obligated to give you your money within 10 days of posting. That seems like a really long time. But if you send, if you sign up for e-refund, those funds come to you probably within two or three days. Otherwise, you will be receiving a paper check that we have to request through our accounts payable department and we will mail it through the US Postal Service, which is less than ideal. So I highly encourage you to go to this part of your portal, look this up, and sign up for e-refunds. Next slide. This is just the process. Paul had already talked about the two-step uh, verification. Your portal will require you to do this again. Next. You have to put in either a, a checking account or a savings account. Next. And here's where you accept the agreement to take this money into your bank account. Next. And here you go. Your money is all ready to go. And you can change this at any time. You can delete this at any time. You have full access to this through your portal. Next. Totally different topic, but your graduate education is very valuable. And actually probably one of the largest purchases you'll, you'll have in your lifetime. Something that Seton Hall has done is we have partnered up with a third party insurance processor. We have nothing to do with this. We don't administer it. We don't have, we don't get a cut of the premiums. It's very reasonable. It's only 1% of your tuition and it's fully accessible through your portal. I'm just highlighting it. I'm not endorsing it, but with COVID and all the things everyone has gone through in the last two years, this is probably something that you may want to consider. They have an 800 number. You can talk to their agents and you buy this by semester. So you can buy it one semester. Maybe you think you have a, a surgery coming up or maybe um, even um, a family member who's injured that maybe you're going to have to take care of and you may have to step out for a semester, but you're halfway through. What do you do about those bills? Next. So here's a little bit of the highlights of protecting your valuable um, education. And again, like I said, I'm not endorsing it, but I want you to know that it's available. After the ad drop period, this is no longer accessible to you for the semester. So you have to make a decision between now and the ad drop period if you're interested in doing this. So I highly uh, recommend that you contact them, read about it, inquire about it, and make your own personal decision if you'd like to do this or not. We've only been doing this is only our second year, so you know, it's just something to consider right on there on the right hand side on the screen when you go into your portal where you would sign up for your refunds. 
is where you can click on there and find out more information about the tuition protection program. Next. Here's our information to contact us. There's an 800 number. Our office is always staffed during the week, Monday through Friday. So we're here for all of your questions. I would say the Bursar's department is like the air traffic controller for your finances. Basically, we bill for tuition, collect payments. Um, if you're online, it doesn't matter because everything we do is online. The only time you really need to visit the Bursar's office is if you want to pay cash, which people do very rarely today. One thing I do want to mention before I uh, let you go is if you have your own health insurance and you were charged for health insurance on your tuition bill, and you'll need to waive that online and you can find that on the website. If you want to buy a, a parking permit, you can go to parking services and have that charged to your account. We also will be the, um, the office that will handle any kind of third party payments for you if your employer is going to reimburse you for it and you need a copy of a statement or any kind of that information, that will be our office and you just send an email to us and we'll help you out with that. So I thank you for your time. You probably most likely won't speak to me unless you have a problem. And many of you pass through the university and we never have a conversation, but if you need me or if you need anybody in my office, we're here to help you and have a great semester and welcome to Seton Hall. Oh, in the chat, there were a few questions in there um, and I have to applaud you for your bargaining power, but unfortunately the tuition and fees is, are set by the, the Board of Regents and we just administer that. So the bursar's office has no ability to wave down technology fees or anything because you're using your own personal laptop. Also, there is a university fee for summer and winter and all of the details of the fees can be found on the shoe.edu website uh, under the bursar's web page and you just search uh, tuition and fees and you can find everything that's there. But if you have any uh, questions on your individual statement, don't hesitate to email us or call us and we'll help you out. Did I miss anything, Monica, in the chat? No, I think we're good. We, we'll probably circle back around though. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. So now we're going to move along to student services. Um, so the first question goes to Justin Kraft and the Career Center. So given the current job climate, some graduate students are concerned about career options and services. So how can the Career Center best support students who are job searching? And can you talk a little bit more about career mentors and career fairs? Oh, I'm sorry, with that? Yep. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, yep, there you go. So good evening, everyone. Uh, absolutely happy to help. If you could please uh, go to the next slide. So we support students in a number of, uh, a number of different ways, but uh, where I'd like to start is that we have individualized career assistance to all students. So the way our centers work out, each, uh, set up is each of our advisors works with a specific cohort of students and corresponds with those faculty and all of the areas that support that. So that's one of the things I really would encourage you to do is get to know your advisor. We're going to know more about that field and really be able to help you navigate um, that job market. I, I think it's a really interesting time out there, you know, with a uh, remote and high flex and just uh, everything that's impacting that. And so I think that's one of the really great things that you get from being a student at Seton Hall University is you can work with that advisor and really come up with a plan that's going to make sense for you. Like myself, I work with all the students in the graduate counseling programs and, you know, to figure out what option makes sense for them and really to help them connect with those resources. OK, and I think there's a number of different resources, whether that's more of a tool or advice, whether it's something like res uh, resumes, cover letters, interviewing. We have a number of different tools there. One I particularly love is Big Interview, which allows you to practice interviewing. And since so many of them are virtual right now, you can record your answer, play it back, see how it goes and really practice. Um, but it really we have the resource that makes sense for you and where that's going to be, because I think every student is different, particularly given uh, all the different programs and all the different areas that we support. So I think really one of the first steps I'm going to recommend is come in, meet with your advisor, and we can really work with you to figure out what's going to make sense for you and where you want to go and help you kind of figure that out. Um, you can set up appointments. 
uh, through Compass once you're set up there, or you can email or call your advisor. Um, you know, there's a number of different ways we can meet in person, virtually, whatever works for you. Um, but I think that's one of the first things that I really do want to highlight because it is a really interesting job market and it probably will be for the next uh, couple of years, right? And so I think that's part of where we want to be able to work with you and help you find what makes sense for you. If you could head to the next slide, please. And so we do a number of different events in person, virtual, and kind of everything in between. To start, we do a large career fair every semester. Uh, the fall one will be September 15th uh, in Bethany from three to five. Hopefully you guys all stop in there. Um, and we our spring date uh, is be determined probably towards the end of March. We also do some small industry targeted events and fairs. We have a finance networking forum. We have a media sports and marketing networking forum. Uh, we do a couple in the spring. We also do an education career fair and a nursing career fair. So depending on the industry, we may have some events more of that nature. But throughout the semester, we are also doing different panels and speakers and info sessions. Um, last year I organized, uh, well, we worked with the School of Diplomacy to organize one with the Peace Corps. Uh, we did one with the South Orange Police Department. We've done with a number of government agencies. Um, we do a number of ones with major finance firms, uh, a lot of different employers. Uh, hopefully in the next year we'll be doing some uh, site visits again. We've been doing that prior to COVID and uh, we're looking to get that restarted. We are part of the Big East and we do some programming uh, with the Big East Career Consortium as well. So we do a number of events there, usually something around the time of the Big East tournament. And we also offer the opportunity for employers to do interviews in our space. Um, or we help uh, coordinate it. Uh, a lot of employers are doing it virtually right now, so we kind of help coordinate that through our system. There are also events through Handshake, which is our online job and internship database. Uh, we also have some event management there. I'll talk more about that uh, right now. Um, so that's something that everyone will have access to. You, uh, your account is automatically created about two weeks after the semester starts. You'll be able to access that through PirateNet, which I know was mentioned earlier. You just click on the check chiclet and it gets you in there any job any internship that we're aware of that's where we're going to post it you can find information about who's attending our major career fairs and there's also a number of events where employers reach out to us and say hey we want to connect with your students and you can just go in there and find all those different events there as well they're not necessarily organized by us but they're great resources a lot of fortune 500 and similar companies are posting in there uh, candid careers is great for informational resources to help you kind of identify what are the skills that I need to be successful within my community or within my profession and how do I start to identify that? Um, and I know part of the question was also about internships, you know, depending on the field, the timing can vary or I know there's some folks here in some of the graduate counseling programs, right? That's going to be a little bit more through your program. Same if you're doing some of the programs through the uh, School of Health Sciences. So that may vary based on your program, how that's going to get set up, but we can absolutely help you uh, with the resumes, the interviewing, you know, uh, the full gambit there. Um, and we do a lot to help you just build those connections, right? Because that's one of the key things that it's going to help you throughout your career, both with regards to your time at Seton Hall and afterwards. So we have an alumni uh, page or um, a LinkedIn group that we do with alumni there. We work with the Office of Alumni Relations. We bring a lot of alumni back as part of our programs, um, especially our networking forums. We can help you identify professional associations that are in your space and really that's part of where you can meet with your advisor and say hey this is something that i'm interested in do you know somebody i could reach out to and we can help you say you know help you find those individuals whether that's connecting with faculty whether it's through linkedin professional or a few other resources and i think that's uh, one of the greatest resource you get is we have a great community, we have a great alumni network, and it's uh, trying to identify that to find somebody that has gone down that path so you can really see what worked for them and gain that advice. Um, and next slide, please. And you can see this is our website. If you haven't uh, taken a look at it yet, you can get there, go to the SHU site and go all the way down. I'll make an announcement so you can get there as well uh, once I'm done speaking. But it's uh, the entry point for a lot of our resources, a lot of different tools that we do have accessible to students. Some you can get through PirateNet, like Handshake, Candid Career, Big Interview. But this is a good overview. And certainly if you're looking at trying to get an internship or something you know, during your first year, take a look at the resume resources, any tips for how to use Handshake, uh, you can find those as well. You'll find on this page is our general email, careers at shoe.edu. On the next one is my uh, general email as well. So you can certainly follow up if you have any questions for me after today as well. Um, but that's about all I got. And if there's any questions in the chat, I'll answer those, you know, once I'm done talking. 
Uh, but yeah, welcome everybody. We look forward to working with you. Awesome, thank you, Justin. Um, so our next question is um, revolved around student engagement. So as we think about the fall, some graduate students are asking about how they can get involved in different opportunities. So this next question is for Winston. Um, as a graduate student, what extracurricular activities or clubs are there and what is the Graduate Student Association? Hello, so uh, good evening to you all. Uh, like I'm sure you've heard uh, many times as you were an undergrad, there's always something to get involved with on your college campus. Um, it is true, we do have over 130 clubs and organizations um, that you as graduate students can also participate in along with your undergraduate students, um, colleagues, but the various schools that your uh, graduate programs are housed in may also have graduate associations such as HEXA, which is the Higher Education Graduate Student Association and the Graduate Diplomacy Council, which is housed in our School of Diplomacy. So there are opportunities um, outside of those for, for you as graduate students to get involved. We do have a tool, though, called our engagement ca um, calculator that can assist in helping students to match um, to sort of clubs and organizations based on their interests. Um, and I will pop a, a link to that into the into the chat um, shortly. Um, I consider this pretty much a starting point for students new to campus or just new to getting involved. It's a it's an easy way to sort of start that conversation. Um, <clears throat> I would also be remiss if I didn't note that involvement itself um, does not only mean membership in organizations. It's also going to our fitness center um, or the rec center. Uh, it's walking around a track with friends or have an opportunity to walk around the track with a faculty member to talk um, expertise. It's also going to sporting events <clears throat> from soccer to volleyball, baseball, swimming, and of course our basketball team. So getting involved means living, breathing, and being part of this campus community. It could also be something as simple as grabbing lunch in our dining hall with a faculty member. Um, and as mentioned earlier, and I answered a question in the chat, uh, our dining hall does have fantastic options, including vegetarian options, as well as for folks who have food sensitivities. So you have opportunities there as well. Um, the Graduate Student Association is another opportunity for you to make an impact on the campus. You know, here at Seton Hall, uh, we want to make sure that your experience, that the experience of our graduate students um, is also robust and meaningful. Uh, we understand that for some graduate students, free time can be in short supply, uh, but we also encourage you to be part of the community as much as you can, sort of help your fellow graduate students. And being a part of the GSA is one of those opportunities to provide op additional opportunities for your graduate students to, to be integrated into our campus. If you do have specific questions about uh, engagement or being engaged on the campus, I encourage you to email engagement, E-N-G-A-G-E-M-E-N-T at shu.edu. And one of our engagement specialists, or even myself included, uh, will certainly connect with you and answer any questions, additional questions that you might have about getting connected to campus. Um, and our university website will continue to be upgraded, updated to reflect any additional things. So make sure that you're checking out our university calendar, making sure that you're seeing what's happening on the campus and taking some time to, um, to get involved. Fantastic, thanks Winston. Um, so now we're gonna go into additional questions that we received from the chat. Um, we received a, a number of different questions regarding the campus ID card. So we, we put a link into um, the chat to just talk a little bit more about it, but uh, you are able to upload um, a picture um, for the campus ID office. And once that picture is received, you can go ahead and pick up that ID card. Um, the ID office is located in Duffy Hall, room 63. Um, or you can also um, email the campus ID office at campusid at shu.edu. So they are available um, for that as well. Um, the campus ID card uh, gets you into um, certain buildings, but it also is available for the, the Regan Athletic Center. So we did have a question about access. Um, so even if you are a student at the IHS uh, campus, you, you are able to come to the, the Regan Athletic Center to work out. So that's something um, that you should all take advantage of. It's a great facility um, for your mental and your physical health. Um, other questions that we received in the chat uh, revolve around, um, let's see here. 
I think we actually got to many of them through here. Uh, one question that we got uh, can go to Chris. Um, can you please talk a little bit about how a student would go about the thesis mentor project? So for students doing a research thesis, generally, what are some ways that students can get involved with their faculty members and how that process works? Sure, thanks, Monica. And yeah, I saw a couple of questions like that that I had responded to in the chat, but I can see where there might be, um, you know, universally some some question around that. When it comes to the thesis process, at least in my experience, a lot of that starts almost immediately after the admission process is complete. So my recommendation is, much as I had spoken about earlier, is to identify a faculty mentor with whom you share some common research interests. Um, oftentimes that pairing is done within the academic department itself through the advisement process. And then you can work with that person about um, work that can happen throughout your academic career with us at the graduate level, um, you know, beginning to explore different research interests and then looking ahead to the completion of your coursework and beyond when the actual dissertation or thesis process would begin. Um, whether there's a comprehensive exam at the end of coursework or not, again, is dependent upon the program of study that someone would be enrolled in. So my recommendation would be to link up with a faculty member within the department or college as soon as possible to talk about the, um, uh, you know, the research and thesis process there. Fantastic, that's great. Um, the other questions that we had revolve around um, health insurance. Uh, so one of the things that I'll drop into the chat as well is the link to the student health insurance. So um, all full time students as well as international students are required to have health insurance here at Seton Hall. Um, if you already have health insurance, as Kathy had mentioned, meaning you're on a, a different plan, you can waive Seton Hall's student health insurance, um, but you will need to do that by September 4th. So I, I did drop a link in the chat where you're able to do that, but basically you'll log into your student portal and under Bursa our account, you'll click on student health insurance waive or enroll, and then you'll um, basically get funneled through that process there. Um, and you'll provide the information requested on the form. So if you have any questions about that, please let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to help you there too. So um, now we're going to move into just pieces of advice. So one of the things that graduate students often ask is, you know, what should I prepare for as I'm thinking about um, coming to Seton Hall? What are some things that I should know now as I'm, I'm getting ready to, to make that journey? Um, so we're just going to go kind of round robin, you know, think about for our panelists, what are a few pieces of advice that you would give a graduate student as they prepare to start their journey at Seton Hall? Um, so let's go ahead and start with uh, Brooke. OK, I hope that you can hear me. I might be having connection issues. Um, but my advice would just be to uh, get involved uh, because the Seton Hall community of people is really special and it's, you know, it's going to be the part that really lasts you your whole life in addition to the education you gain. Great advice. How about Paul? So being a former grad student in Seton Hall, I won't say how long ago. Um, <clears throat> I think the, 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 the best thing, the best piece of advice I could give is to find those other few students in your cohort, in your, in your program, in your class, um, and really form that learning community. Um, because they really do, they become your lifelong friends, they become your lifeline to anything at the university. They might have dealt with an issue with IT or with the bursar, and when you have the issue, they could say, oh, go talk to Paul, he can handle that for you, right? And, 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 that, um, and that really helps you get through the, the anxiety that builds in, in, in any academic program. So that, that would be my piece of advice. That's great advice, Paul. Um, how about you, Gary? I have two bits of advice. One is to, is to take advantage of the resources that you have available as a graduate student. Right here, on, here on the presentation, we have a, a small number, a small sampling uh, of of the um, resources available to graduate students at the university, whether it's the Career Center or the library. Uh, but there are literally dozens of office, offices on campus uh, with hundreds of employees um, here to help you uh, in in 
navigating your way through, through your, your graduate experience. So, so definitely take advantage of those resources. Uh, and then just going back to something that Winston uh, mentioned, I think Brooke touched on it too, is get involved. Um, you know, if you're interested in athletics, there, there are almost every one of our teams, um, athletic teams, play on campus. Really, men's basketball is the only one that, that, is, uh, that is off site. So if you enjoy watching baseball or soccer or swimming, um, you know, go to those events. Um, you know, anything that you could do just to, just to you know, become part of the, of the Seton Hall community, um, you know, just, just get out there and find something that you're interested in and take advantage of those programs. Great. How about you, Kathy? I, I guess my advice would be short and uh, simple. If something is going wrong, ask somebody. We're all here. We've been around the block. Ask us and we'll point you in the right direction. We might not have the right answer, but life comes in the way sometimes. Just don't walk away. Talk to one of us and we'll, we'll help you out or we'll get you in the right direction. That's great, Kathy. Thank you. Um, Chris. Thanks. Um, two things come to mind. One, uh, I would reiterate what Paul had said earlier in terms of uh, networking, you know, really. I mean, for me, I'm still close friends with folks that I met in graduate school 20 plus years ago. Um, so I think networking is critical and it's it really adds to the whole graduate experience. Um, the other thing is knowing how intense graduate school can be from an academic perspective and knowing that many students are working simultaneously, um, I'd encourage everyone to place a lot of importance on self care. So that may mean, you know, taking time for yourself, for friends, for family, for hobbies, um, readings outside of textbooks or academic journals and things of that nature, but essentially time to decompress and just kind of get away from it because I do think that's important as well as to have that balance. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. And how about you, Winston? And all the good ones are taken, but <laughs> you know, um, I think ultimately the other piece of advice that I will provide to you is um, there is a, an abundance of opportunity to learn about something new on this campus, uh, whether it be professionally, so it'll be opportunities for graduate internships, assistantships. Look for something outside of what your comfort zone is. Explore the um, the different kinds of um, jobs and opportunities, specifically in higher education. Uh, I'd be remiss not to mention that space, but there are so many places and spaces to learn on our campus. Take advantage of them. Ask questions constantly um, if you don't know the answer to them. And as everybody has said before, make sure that you network um, and expand that network while you're here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Winston. Um, yes, so just to reiterate what all of our panelists um, have said, and thank you to all of our panelists for being here today, it's really important to, to ask for help. You know, we're all here to help support you. And our goal at Seton Hall is to really um, focus on student success, not only in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom. So whatever we can do to help facilitate that, um, your well-being is very important to us, and we want to do all that we can to help support you in that way. So um, we know that we we had also uh, responded to a number of different questions that came through the Q and A. Um, if if you did have a question that that you need additional clarification on, please let us know. You can email us at studentservices at shu.edu, and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction and help answer any questions. Um, but we want to just thank you for your time today. Thank you for being with us and welcome to the Seton Hall family. We look forward to seeing you on campus very soon. Um, and if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you and go Pirates.